All right, we're going to get started, everyone. Um, it feels wonderful to all be together. Um, we haven't done this in a long time, and I especially to be together with our other colleagues from different departments, from anesthesia and psychiatry and critical care medicine. So to say the last two years was uh, impactful on us, of course, is a gross understatement. Um, I don't believe we really yet understand exactly what's happened to us in our careers and our families um, over the last two years. I don't think we really understand the full impact of that. Um, so uh, it's a great honor for me to introduce today's speaker, Wayne Tormala. I had the honor of working with Wayne uh, for over a decade in Arizona, where Wayne was in charge of the Bureau of Chronic Disease for the Arizona Department of Health Services. And he was wildly successful there. And we actually had a lot of things that we partnered on. And you could say, well, you know, I was in EMS and Wayne was in chronic disease, kind of the other end of the world. Um, but we actually ended up partnering on all kinds of different things um, on cardiovascular programs, stroke programs, um, uh, addiction programs, and it, even mental health programs. So it turned out that we got really, we started to get data that our EMS system, so I had about 20 thousand paramedics, EMTs and paramedics and in Arizona. And when we had all these anecdotal reports of people committing suicide, we actually studied it and we had an extraordinarily high rate of suicide amongst our first responders. And Wayne was very helpful in developing a first responder resiliency program. So you get the picture. We, we actually did a lot of different things together. I, uh, learned a ton from Wayne and benefited from this, from, from knowing Wayne and watching how he uh, ran his Bureau of Chronic Disease um, and all the things he did that were really amazing. One thing I'll tell you is Wayne ran the most uh, impactful smoking cessation program of any state, and he actually halved smoking rates in the state of Arizona. It was fascinating how he did that. Um, so all kinds of different things that I watched and learned from Wayne, but I was really excited about getting Wayne to come out and talk with us. And we tried, of course, a couple times, the, the virus just laughed at us, um, but we finally uh, pulled it off. And so it's great to be here. And so I want you to uh, give Wayne a big welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Uh, so, if it, I, as Ben said, I worked with him for over a decade. So, after we're done here, if there's anything you wanted to know about Ben, but we're afraid to ask, just come up and uh, let me know. Uh, I, I'm not sure I taught Ben that many things, but one thing I did teach him that he didn't mention was I taught him a little bit how to play the guitar. So that was so that's good. Um, so uh, it's a privilege uh, to be here. Thank you very much for taking time out of your, out of your busy lives, uh, work and personal, to be here. Uh, this is certainly a, a, a critical topic uh, that I believe very strongly in. So I retired a year ago from the Arizona Department of Health Services to dedicate more time to this. So I've been doing work on compassion fatigue, uh, loss and grief for healthcare workers, uh, and just trying to really care for the people who care for others. I think if, that, if I can do that, then I still feel really uh, good, although very humble, about what I'm doing. And I always want to start by saying that uh, I don't know that I have always that much to tell you that you don't already know uh, within yourselves. But the fact is that when life gets disrupted, like it has on many levels for us over the last couple of years, we tend to sometimes, if you're like me, forget what we know uh, in terms of self-care and, and really how to how to take care of, how to put on our own oxygen mask first before we attend to the passenger uh, next to us. So certainly uh, life has been disrupted in addition to COVID. Even pre-COVID, we were looking at the epidemic of loneliness uh, in this country and looking at things like racial injustice uh, that's tearing us apart, the great political divide, uh, looking at uh, not only the, the pandemic, but the shadow pandemic, the things that are happening uh, even because of the pandemic that come in the way of, of all of us. And looking at uh, the fact that even uh, as we look at the news now, uh, we look at what's happening uh, in the Ukraine. Uh, we look at what's happening in Roe versus Wade and whether, whatever side of the coin you're on, it's stressful. Uh, the political divide is stressful regardless of which side of that divide we might find ourselves. So it's not just 
COVID, which is tremendous, but just, uh, we're getting hit 360 degrees. And so there's these kind of levels of stress that we were sharing together. There's kind of three levels of stress or trauma. One is just the fact that if you wake up breathing in today's world, there's a shared stress out there. Uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of turmoil in the world that none of us can escape by just waking up and looking at the news. I was saying in the talk yesterday that I, I, the night before I looked at the local Houston news and I swear I was just looking at the local Phoenix uh, news where I live because it's all about uh, you know, uh, this murder and this assault and everything and we're just bombarded because they know we want to watch that stuff, I guess. Uh, but certainly uh, there's no escape uh, from the turmoil that's going on. So the, we all share that kind of stress by just living in today's world on, on March, on, on May 5th, 2022. Here we are together, we share that stress, but we also have this vicarious stress, the stress of our coworkers that we, that we feel bad about, the stress of our family members, uh, what we see, the, the lives of our patients, of what's going on there, the family members of our patients, and this vicarious stress, which it might not be a direct hit on me, but it's something I absorb day in and day out. I absorb that suffering. And then of course, there's even the third and deeper level, which is my own personal stress. So if, if we've lost our own family members, uh, if, we've, if we've had our own diagnosis of a disease, uh, if we've had our own anxieties about our careers and, and our work, we have direct hits on us. So I wanna just paint that context and when we start talking about uh, compassion fatigue and uh, you know, putting on, uh, uh, protecting ourselves uh, when, when life gets disrupted. I also wanna talk a little bit about a framework about loss. Uh, not only do we have uh, the, uh, the loss that, that we might be experiencing ourselves, but we have cumulative loss. Uh, you know, before COVID and, and it, it, something we do in healthy aging, for example, is talk about as you age, I might, and I'm proud to be probably the oldest person in the room, uh, you get cumulative loss over time. I mean, you lose friends, you, you might've lost a job at some point, you lose loved ones. And so we have that this kind of adds up. And even though we might not be in touch with the loss of today, we have that buildup of loss. Uh, and that certainly um, most of you and probably each of you have experienced in some form or another. But we've also had, we have cumulative loss, but we also have what I would call anticipatory loss. Where we go into to a shift, we go into a work expecting to experience even more loss. And so we have the loss that's occurred in our personal lives. We have the cumulative loss of, of, of just the nature of what we do. And we go into work and, we, and we're thinking about the loss we're, I'm gonna face tomorrow uh, when I go back on the job. And so we fear that, and that creates a lot of anxiety. And we're putting on this emotional armor, right, to protect ourselves from that, but the armor only lasts uh, for so long. And then first, and then we have, you know, the, the direct hits again. Uh, I don't know if, if I'm just assuming that some of us in this room have, have, have experienced personal loss, uh, independent of COVID. Uh, that's just, just, you know, none of us get through life without some loss, some, some sorrow, uh, some trauma. And as, as the, uh, the saying goes, you know, life is only about 20% of the events in our life and about 80% how we manage those events in our life. So I wanna talk a little bit about that and also to paint a context of the difference between what I would call compassion fatigue and burnout. For the difference being compassion fatigue is that we still have a belief in what we're doing. We still have a sense of calling to what we do. We still feel a certain uh, a value and self-worth about helping other people. But our fuel tank, our resilience is running low. Uh, and so if we don't tend to that, uh, then we can, you know, it, we, we, we can come close to what I would call burnout, which is like, now it's time to, to, to take time off. It's time to maybe get professional help. It might even be time for some of us to seek a new career. And so I want to talk about compassion fatigue because here we are, we care about our work, we care about the suffering of others, and we're, we're moving beyond sympathy where we feel sorry for people that, uh, that back in the, I can actually say back in the prior century, but back in the 80s, when I was a, a, a vice president of a world hunger organization, uh, we tried to get people to, to, to mot motivate around their sympathy for 50,000 kids a day who are dying in East Africa of starvation. So how do we move them up the chain from 
sympathy to some empathy so they start feeling some of that suffering themselves to then an actual act of compassion, which I would call empathy in action. And that's what you do. Uh, you, you have compassionate jobs. Uh, you, you have concerns about people who are suffering and you wanna put some action behind that. You're just not sitting back uh, on the armchair being passive about it. And so you're doing something about that, but when we do something about that and things happen outside of our control, uh, and we suffered this enormous loss and all the layers of loss I was just talking about, then it, it's a major concern. So what, what, whatever I can do to offer ideas uh, to help you uh, deal with that uh, in healthy, uh, vibrant ways, uh, then we can talk about that. And what I wanna do is I'm gonna give you a few examples of, of some tools and, and how we can engage in, in intentional self-care about who we are and, and how we go about our work and how we sustain our own sense of well-being. So managing our self-care, um, I think it went, went too fast there. So managing our self-care, I'm talking about intentional practices that we engage in on a regular basis for the purpose of reducing our stress and enhancing our well-being. So intentional, the key word here is intentional. So if, if what do we do to engage in self-care and protect ourselves against compassion fatigue? What are we putting into our life in intentional, proactive ways? Uh, we talk a lot about um, uh, just getting through the day, uh, just taking a deep breath and going at it again. But over time, uh, as I said earlier, that emotional armor gets a bit rusty. Uh, and so we need to tend to that. So when we talk about ideas about what to do, we want to talk, I'm talking about what do you do in your life that's intentional to address compassion fatigue, which is born from the fact that you still do care and believe in what you do against all odds, as it might feel sometimes, uh, but you're still in there and you want to be sustained uh, for the long haul. So the goal here is I have my stress or I have my trauma, but my stress doesn't have me. So there's nothing I can offer that takes away all the stress in your life but maybe I can offer something that helps you identify and manage that stress. So when I do stress, uh, stress management workshops, for example, it's not about, it's not about uh, re removing the stressors in your life, it's about really handling the stressors in your life because none of us get through uh, without that. So when things fall apart, compassion, which I've called empathy in action for others, depends on our capacity for self-compassion. So how can we engage in self-compassion? By self-compassion, what I'm talking about here is mindful attention to the present moment. So you, we've all, mindfulness, we've heard of that, multi-billion dollar industry out there talking about mindfulness. Mindful attention to the present moment, self-acceptance, living my values and exercising loving kindness, not only to others, uh, but to myself. So recapturing the soul of our work. So in the toil of getting things done, we can, all of us are pretty good at describing what we do. I can, I can describe my job and how I do it. That's my professional knowledge, that's my skill, that's what I've been trained to do. I can tell you what my job is and how I do it. But we can easily lose track of the why. So when we see sometimes high, high uh, uh, compassion fatigue rates, even in med school, before folks get out or when, once people get on the job, or as Ben was saying earlier with first responders, uh, we know that, uh, for example, since 9-11, uh, the, uh, the veteran suicide uh, has been five times greater than death by line of duty in the military. Uh, we knew that first responders, uh, not first responders, but firefighters around the country are more deaths owing to suicide than, again, to their line of duty uh, fighting fires. So if that's not alarm, uh, you know, what is? So we can easily do, lose track of the why. So we go into something with, with a certain calling, a certain purpose in doing that. But day in and day out as things happen to us and that cumulative loss and stress, and, and it just builds and builds and our, our emotional armor that we're putting on to deal with it is getting challenged and begins breaking apart. Uh, what do we do to combat that? So we want to find the nexus of head and heart. So you've all been trained in science, uh, but I would be more concerned or equally concerned about your compassion. 
is that at stake, your self-compassion? We know where the evidence is in what we do and our procedures, but where is our sustained energy to do it over time, especially amidst the pandemic and against all odds when too many things are happening way outside of our control that we don't want to see. We know the return on investment of certain programs. And as I was working in chronic disease in, in, in Arizona and Ben and I are working together, you know, we know our programs, we get the outcomes, we invest money here, we get the outcomes, we're all trained. We know how to talk about return on investment, but do we know how to talk or handle our own sense of the need for our unending commitment to do a good job day in and day out? So we know what we do, but we also want to know why, why we do it. So the nexus of head and heart. So, so my whole premise here is that whether it's my work in public health or your work on the front lines and what you do is that to be successful, we have to have the head, the knowledge, the skills, the science, but we also need to tend to the heart. And without that, things get short-lived or we become the kind of person nobody wants to be around or we go home and we're no good to our family uh, because we're so stressed out and we don't want that. Uh, we want a whole picture of health uh, for our life, the whole person. So this is, uh, it's funny when I have a slide very purposely with nothing on it that we get a little, a little sound like that. If I, if I was, I'm so tech unsavvy that, you know, I'd like to say I did that on purpose, but I, I didn't. So I want to offer a few things up and that's why this is blank. So we don't just keep looking at the slide um, in terms of uh, what we can do to take those moments <clears throat> excuse me, and then uh, how we can engage in doing some self audits. And I want to talk about some self audits that we can do. Uh, after we practice them a bit, we can do it in one minute or less. We can do these self audits even in the line of duty. We can do these self audits as we're driving in. We can do these self audits, audits as we return home and we want to be present uh, with our loved ones. And so we talk about meditation. We talk about mindfulness meditation. Uh, and you can, just by a show of hands, how many people actually intentionally meditate? A few? Yeah. Great. Um, well, if, then those of you who do, or if you haven't, if you look up, if you just look at med Google meditation, and you will find thousands of ways to meditate. So I'm not here to say, well, this is how we do it. Uh, but I want to talk about some principles there that you might be able to uh, engage in your own uh, commitment to, and again, uh, the mantra throughout this whole mindfulness and meditation and doing self audits that I'll talk a little bit about in a minute is that we, it, it, that the mantra is, is that it's simple, but it's not easy. So it's simple to meditate. I mean, it's all about breathing. Whatever meditation uh, technique you look up online or learn from other people, it's all about the breath. And there's different ways of breathing, different ways of paying attention to our breath. And the key is to find something that works for you. So we can just breathe, uh, but we, we can call it meditation, or we can just call it quiet time, or we can call it contemplation. I can, I can call it, uh, this is my reflective time. So again, it's, it's not like there's one pill that, I'm, that we all need to swallow here, but there's just how do, we, how do we seek that intentional, again, solitude where we can reflect, maybe do a self audit, uh, we can do it while driving, we can do it while sitting in a lotus position, we can do it while lying in bed, we can do it like while we're walking down the street, uh, we can even do it while we're on the job, these kinds of simple breathing uh, and uh, self audits. So let's do a couple, just a couple samples uh, of breathing. So uh, one thing about breathing deeply is uh, like if, if I take a, a deep breath like this, so you know how when you sneeze, you can't sneeze without your eyes closing? You can't take a quick, deep breath and think at the same time. I mean, just try it right now at your own pace. Just take a, maybe a four count deep breath really quick. During that time, I'm not thinking about my next slide. I'm not, you know, I'm not thinking about, uh, I better get my boarding pass this afternoon. I'm not thinking about the things that might distract me from what I'm doing. So is that, I mean, is that, is that simple? But it's not easy because it's not easy because if I don't get into a, in engaging into a, a practice of doing that for myself, uh, then all I can say is, well, I, yeah, I tried that. 
I tried that, it didn't work. And that's what you hear a lot around different meditation techniques. Yeah, I tried that, uh, it didn't work. Uh, I, I tried to be quiet and, and just pay attention to my breath and I keep getting these thoughts. Uh, and I know people say that these thoughts are like clouds and they can just let them pass through or they're like, they're, like they're, they're the waves, not the ocean. Just let them wash ashore and, and, wait, and wait for the big ocean view to come. Just taking those deep breaths. And so I want to use a, just a couple examples. So one is uh, if we take a, a deep breath, for example, uh, on the four count, and then exhale over four counts. Uh, that's one, just one simple way of doing it. And, and here's the thing about these deep breaths is that when, when we just want to pay attention to our breath in a, in a sort of a quiet personal time, these deep breaths are like a Kickstarter. So like we breathe naturally all day long. And as soon as I stand here and say, okay, now just relax, put your feet on the floor and pay attention to your breath. All of a sudden your breath seems like something you're trying to manage, even though you've been not thinking about it perhaps all day. So again, simple, but not easy. Uh, so let's, let's at your own pace. I would invite you right now to just, you know, yeah, I am going to ask you to put your feet on the floor. I mean, it's one way of doing it. And hands, shoulders relaxed. Uh, my favorite technique in meditation is to have your eyes not closed, but just in a soft gaze in front of you. Uh, that way we, we, we pay more attention to what's going on. And we close our eyes, uh, especially if you're up late last night, like I was watching the Suns beat Dallas pretty bad. <laughs> then. Uh, <laughs> Sorry about that. But then, then uh, you know, close our eyes, we tend to fall asleep, and all of a sudden meditation is just this passive thing. We need that rest. Maybe we needed to sleep. But uh, just, uh, you know, hand, relaxed, you know, shoulders, relaxed head, and just take, take four deep breaths at a four, I mean, take one deep breath on a four count, and then back out on a four count. You can breathe in through your mouth, out through your nose. You can breathe in through your nose. Whatever works for you, and try to pay attention to your breath as it's passing through your nose or over your lips, or maybe you're paying attention to your belly, doing belly breathing, your belly expanding as you're, as you're inhaling. Let's just take a minute or so and just invite you to do that with me. There's four count in and four count out. Okay, we can come back. Thank you for doing that. And I want to talk about one other technique that's uh, a lot of evidence uh, has been given to uh, mil active military and first responders on their way to a traumatic event. And it might be the third or fourth or fifth traumatic event they've gone to that day, seeing horrific, horrific things, uh, which is called, and maybe you've heard of this, it's called box breathing. A lot of evidence behind that. So again, it's these four count deep breaths, but if you can picture a box, we're breathing in for four. And so we're breathing in for four and then we're holding it for a four count. We're breathing out for a four count. We're holding it again for a four count. And we just imagine that box, uh, looking at military folks going into a hostile action, look at first responders encountering traumatic events. This technique has been used and shown to be tremendously effective in helping people be present and, and calmer uh, and less anxiety ridden and therefore better able to perform uh, in the event they're about to be called to. So I invite you again, you know, relaxed, uh, just eyes in a soft gaze, where you can close them and just four count in, hold it, four count out, hold it. And just let's do two or three cycles of that just so you can experience it.
Okay, thanks. We, we could do this for the, the rest of the session, but uh, might have to wake you up when it's over. Okay, on self-compassion, quote Fred Rogers, Mr. Rogers, I know when uh, my sons were growing up, you know, we'd watch, I, I would sit there with them and watch Sesame Street and then watch Mr. Rogers. Of course, I'm a lot older than most of you, but uh, you know who Mr. Rogers is, probably Fred Rogers. Uh, anyways, he says on self-compassion, it's very important to look inside yourself and find that loving part that you must take good care of and never be mean to, because that's the part of you that allows you to love your neighbor, and your neighbor is anyone you happen to be with at any time in your life, uh, Mr. Rogers. Okay, looking at mindfulness beyond the buzz, and I've called it meditation, contemplation, attending to the moment, purposeful quiet time. It's not about remedying all of life's issues. It's not about achieving a blissful state. It's not about cultivating personal power or having nice, happy feelings all the time. It's not about achieving a stress-free life or becoming an all-knowing person. And it's not about escaping what's going on. But purposeful contemplation being awareness of thoughts and feelings in the present moment in the service of self-understanding and pur purposeful action is about awakened decision making. So when we talk about mindfulness meditation, it's not about going blank and just getting away from it all, but it's about what's leading me towards more awakened decision making about how I'm managing my own stress, my own trauma, managing the stress and trauma of others around me. So one thing, one of the self audits I like to talk about uh, when we're having a quiet time uh, during meditation and after you've done some deep breathing and maybe you just start, you just sit there and have nice, soft, uh, casual breathing is uh, ask, yourself, ask yourself this question, uh, what's it like to be me? So we are, I have doing some talks yesterday and, and it's like if I can, I can pick on Ben because Ben and I are, are buddies. Uh, if, so if, if Ben, when we were working together, if he came into my office or, and he said, uh, how you doing? What do you think I would say? Okay, I'm okay, right? Because that's, that's the script. I mean, that's what we agreed. We, don't, we, we agreed to do these things with each other. How you doing? I'm okay. If Ben came into my office and said, hey, Wayne, um, I'm wondering, what's it like to be Wayne? Now, it's, it's not like I can say, well, I can say, hey, Ben, not now. Uh, or I can say, hey, close the door. Uh, I can tell you kind of what it's like to be me. So what I invite us to do is to ask ourselves, it's a simple self-audit, to ask ourselves, what what's it like to be me? Not how am I doing, but how, what's it like to be me? Uh, and even furthermore, what's it like to be me in holistic uh, fashion? And, I, and I'll lead us through that if, uh, if I see what, how these slides are. <laughs> these slides are a little different than my, my, my thing, so I'm doing a little juggling here. But um, uh, I'm just going to, so I'm just going to go freeform here. What's it like to be me in five different ways? What's it like to be me physically in terms of bodily comfort? What's it like to be me mentally? in terms of too many things in the air, too many whack a mole stuff going on, uh, too, too many multitasking, uh, the, the monkey mind of going from one limb to another real quick. And we all have that. We all have monkey minds very natural. It's part of being human. But what's it like to be me mentally? Am I, am I managing that? Uh, you know, I got my kids off to school. I'm, I'm getting into work, and work is really hard. And I come home late at night, and my kids are already in bed. Uh, something like that's going on. I haven't eaten well for like two weeks now, and, I, and I'm just really on thin ice. So what's, how am I managing that? So what's it like to be me physically in terms of my bodily comfort? What's it like to be mentally? What's it like to be me emotionally? Uh, am I, do I see a balance? Do I, each of our days, each of our days contains some happy moments and some not so happy moments. Do I see the balance? Am, am, I, am I getting so caught up in the not so happy moments that I'm, I'm not, I'm forgetting about those moments in my life that might be going well? 
that I might, uh, if I pay attention to me, perhaps I would be a little more grateful for? Am I seeing the balance? So again, the, the, the self audits, the reflective time, contemplative time is not about achieving a blissful state and just being happy all the time, but it's about recognizing that life has both. And, and the key is to how do we seek that balance in our life? Uh, none of us are gonna be happy all the time. Hopefully not too many of us are gonna be sad all the time. So how do we bring that together? So what's it like to be me in the self audit, physically, mentally, emotionally? What's it like to be me socially? Social connectedness, and we talked yesterday with, with Julie over here and others about the epidemic of loneliness and how do we get people around identifying that they're lonely and being have the, self, the kind of self-courage to deal with that and what are some of the things they can do to get out of that state of loneliness. So the social connectedness, uh, again, I'm looking at myself physically, mentally, emotionally, uh, and socially, and then the fifth that I propose is, uh, what's it like to be me in terms of my spiritual health? Whichever form, tradition, uh, or way you define that for yourself. Is it bringing some lightness into my life? Is it bringing me a sense of purpose uh, out there? Is it bringing me a bigger, a, a bigger picture view of the world? Because when we go into work every day and, we're, and we're, we're attending to the same stressful events day in and day out, uh, there's a big picture out there that we often don't get to look at. So the self audit that I propose is looking at me, looking at myself, what's it like to be me physically, mentally, emotionally, socially, and spiritually? And then physically, what, you know, what are some of the things I can do about that? Uh, we talk in, the, in this group alone, if we were to do an inventory of your, your physical, your goals for your physical health, uh, we, if, they were, if it was anonymous and I just gathered these goals for yourself, we'd see everything from uh, uh, running, the, running a marathon to I just am trying to get out of bed each morning without too much pain. And so what I propose is those are two equal goals, two noble goals, uh, if we have the self-courage to look at them. So how am I doing physically? It isn't about some standard that's way up here that might be out, out of my reach uh, what I'm doing mentally, again, is you know, I'm managing my schedule. I'm managing the things that have entered into my life uh, in a way, and I'm attending to that. I'm identifying that. I'm just not trying to put on that armor uh, that's going to grow old over time uh, and get away from that. What, and what am I doing uh, emotionally? Again, uh, am I, it's okay to have sad moments. Am I letting myself express that? Am I letting myself talk to my loved ones? about my, some of the things that are really bothering me that I don't want to bother them about, when in fact, uh, most of our loved ones would just love to engage with us on those levels, uh, at, especially if it's at the risk of being more and more distant uh, from them. Uh, and then looking at socially and, and spiritually, what's it like to be me, a self-audit? I'll just see what, what slides. So in self-care is in balance, we are kind towards ourselves and we're kind towards others. We forgive ourselves and we forgive those who may be temporarily unkind towards us. Uh, do we have that kind of forgiveness in our life? When I say temporar temporarily unkind to us, I'm speaking specifically about home and work. Uh, I've done a lot of work in, uh, in Alzheimer's and dementia and especially caring for caregivers, uh, those people who are caring for a spouse or for a parent uh, and when you talk about, uh, uh, there's an, another kind of loss I talked earlier about, cum cumulative loss, anticipatory loss. <clears throat> there's also what we call ambiguous loss. That I don't think it's just reserved for caregivers of people who are trying to care for a parent or a spouse that's, that's in the room but not in the room. Uh, that kind of ambiguous loss that we can't define. That oftentimes grief support groups don't allow people in until the person has died even though you're already grieving the loss of someone in your life. But we also have, it's not just about someone in our life, it's about, it's about sometimes um, getting, losing a sense of our goals, losing a sense of where are we going with all this? Uh, I've been buried for the last couple of years, day in and day out, doing 12 hour shifts. Uh, and sometimes all I see is, is, uh, is uh, horrific uh, disasters that I, that I can't do much about. Uh, but, you know, that ambiguous loss, and we, unless we, we put a tag on it and we identify it, uh, then we, it, it's there. And so how do we look to that and identify those kinds of things 
uh, in our life. Okay, so I'm going to say a few more things. <laughs> um, another, another kind of self-audit that I, I want to talk about is uh, I talked about what's it like to be me. Is uh, just looking at uh, am I okay? How do people see me in the workplace and at home? Uh, how, if if I were to look at myself and as uh, if those of you who walked in a little early, you saw the a cover slide where my my photo was like this big, and I thought, oh my god, I don't want to want to look at that, but the, uh, you know, not only what's it like to be me, but what's it like to be with the people that are with me in my life, the sense of other, compassion for self, but also compassion uh, for others. What's it like to be them? So what I'd like to do is, uh, We've talked about compassion fatigue. It's a natural thing. We all experience it. There are some tools we can use that might be helpful. Uh, is, there's uh, talk a little bit about how do, we put, how do we put these tools into action in the workplace? I know Ben is very concerned, very committed to trying to create a culture uh, in the workplace where we can talk about these kinds of things. Uh, and that we're just not asking you to, hey, buck up, be strong, uh, keep that armor going on, uh, and, and do your job. Uh, it's not what Ben's about at all, if I could say that, Ben. How do we create that kind of culture? How do we, how do we treat our fellow workers? How do we treat those who uh, are, have that armor on so heavy that you can't even put a dent in it? Is it okay to ask somebody else, uh, hey, what's it like to be you? How's it going? Can we have those kinds of talks? It's nice to go out and have some beers, and I love doing that myself. Uh, it's nice to go out and play some softball, if we can do something like that. Uh, but what, what can we do to be like, real with each other right in the midst of the workplace? What kind of courage uh, can we put on, can we envelop for ourselves that really connects us uh, with others in real authentic ways. Which leads me to another kind of self-audit. So the self-audit is uh, uh, something I, I, I picked up. Uh, it, was, uh, it was called a, uh, a test for authenticity. How, how, how authentic am I leading my life? Uh, and the self-audit goes like this. It goes four questions. The first question is, uh, and I'll just, I'll, I'll ask myself these questions. First question is, uh, will I die? Will I die? Uh, the answer is yes. I mean, that's, you know, I expect that's going to happen. Uh, the second question becomes, when will I die? And my answer to that is, uh, well, I, I don't know, but I hope I still have some time to do these kinds of things and to be with my loved ones and enjoy life a little bit. So I know I'm going to die. I'm not sure when. The third question becomes, well, at the moment of my death, what do I feel would be the most important things in my life? My answer to that is uh, my family, my friends, things I've done in my life to try to address uh, human suffering in some way. And then the fourth question becomes, Okay, when, I know when I'm going to die. I mean, I know I'm going to die. I don't know when. I know it's going to be important to me. The fourth question becomes, am I attending to this on a daily basis? Am I attending to this today? So I was telling, I think I was telling Julie yesterday in the session that I did, did a little bit of work in Rwanda, post-genocide Rwanda, and, and uh, uh, I, I sort of, with my, my sons and my wife, I put on this, on this facade of like, there's no risk. You know, I'm just, I need to do this. There's no risk to what I'm, I'm about to do. Uh, but then of course, I started, you know, there was some risk involved. And so before I went, I decided, well, I'm gonna write a letter to my wife and each of my two sons uh, and just tell them how much they meant to me in the event that I don't come back. 
But then I gave those letters to a friend and said, hey, if I don't come back, will you give these letters to my wife, Sue, and my two sons? Uh, she agreed. She thought it was kind of a heavy, heavy duty, but she uh, agreed to do it. Of course, I, you know, I did come back. Uh, I'm here, but then I decided, well, I'm just going to give them the letters anyway. Why, why would I, you know, wait till I, my, you know, I'm gone? So I did, and it was amazing how meant, how much it meant to them, and how much it meant to me to be able to share those letters uh, in person. And it's almost like uh, if you, if you have a, like a. My own fantasy would be if I'm on my deathbed, but very coherent, and I'm telling everybody, you know, how I, you know, love them and f feel about them. Uh, that would be the message. Uh, and so, again, it's like, so the the real I die, yes, all the way to. Am I attending to these important things now, or am I just putting them off uh, to a later date? And of course, the gift is that when we attend to these special things now, uh, it gives back to us immediately. All of a sudden, uh, our stressors are more manageable. Uh, we feel more balanced in our life in a holistic kind of way. Uh, and we're more pleasant to be around. Uh, it's just, you know, there are many, many payoffs uh, to, to how that happens. So when I say, uh, you know, the self audits, the sort of the, you know, what's it like to be me physically, mentally, socially, and the whole bit there. Um, if I commit to doing that every day for a minute, for two weeks, chances are I'm on my way to thinking like that. So what I can do now uh, is uh, I can just not even say the whole question of what's it like to be me. It's there. It's, it's part of what I do. And the gift of that is if some parts of my life in those five areas I talked about aren't going so, so well, I'm also aware that there's other parts of my life that are going okay. And so I'm, I'm, I'm feeling more balanced uh, in what I do. So I would just invite you to, to try that. Uh, you know, it, again, simple but not easy, but if you try it. Also, the will I die, if I, I mean, I, if, when I ask myself, will I die, it just goes right to like, I'm, you know, what am I doing today uh, to, to, to express to my friends and my loved ones, my coworkers, how much I appreciate them. Uh, you know, what am I, it's, it's so simple. And what does that do to them? And then that comes back to me uh, multifold. So um, I'm not one, as you can probably guess, I'm not, I'm here to sell, I'm not part of the mindfulness industry, but there's a lot of things that are very mindful uh, that we can do. Uh, when I was about seven years old, you know, if I spilled the milk at the dinner table, my mother would say, Wayne, you need to be more mindful about, pay attention, you know, so. Uh, mindfulness, I guess, was in my life in a, at a very, very early age, not just in, in the last uh, decade or so of bestseller books. Uh, so I think we have a, a few minutes left. If questions, comments, I mean, and then I know we're going we're gonna to close out with these resources. Anything? Yes, Solia? I think one of the residents had a quote while he was the other day on the show. Came on. There's a mic right there. Yeah, one of the residents came on right before we started shift. Uh, they raise your hand if it was you. I don't remember who it was. And saying, uh, everyone say a word of how you're feeling right now. Um, who was it that said that? Well, that's right. That's right. And and I think that was a such a beautiful way to kind of do what what you're kind of saying of doing these self audits just for a little moment. And in our sh in our shifts, I think that that we have it. Things can be so busy, and having something built in like that is such a beautiful way to incorporate these concepts, kind of into our busy and daily lives. Of yeah, take a moment and pausing. Yeah, how am I feeling, or how am I, how am I doing, or what is it like to be me uh, in that moment? And I think that was a beautiful way to do that. And I think the more that we can find ways to incorporate this. Uh, the better off we can do in, in taking care of ourselves. So thank you so much. Any other comments, reactions, or questions? You know, Wayne, I, this stuff is real, but it's hard to wrap your head around. And I think you were, I think it was maybe you that told me years ago, if you're not 100% authentic with yourself, eventually it's going to catch up with you. 
eventually. You can, you can run for a while, but eventually it catches up with you. And um, I don't know, this, this is not easy stuff to talk about, but you know, I think it's important that we at least try to scratch the surface and you know, try to make some attempts to, to be authentic with ourselves about what we're doing and what we're trying to do. You know, another thing I see is that we focus so hard on trying to be perfect and to not make any mistakes. And what we do is just inherently fraught with potholes. And it's so it's impossible not to make mistakes. Um, and we get sort of hyper-focused on that as opposed to the huge point of all the great work that you all do all the time. And it gets overshadowed, I see, by our desire to be perfect at what we do. Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, you're you're right, exactly right, Ben. It's hard to get our our head around, and it's why I try, I try to really strongly convey the message of uh, to give it a try and be intentional about it. Give it a two week. Trial. I mean, don't just say, "Well, I tried to meditate." I tried to meditate. You know, too many. I, I'm too busy. It's like you know, just it's not for me. Uh, but there are ways that we can do these self audits and just take these these times to ourselves uh, that can help us be balanced. We did a. We have. A, we taught a simple mindfulness meditation to in Arizona to caregivers. I mentioned earlier people who are caring for uh, adults in their life and in dementia. And it was so simple, but now we have these support groups all over the state doing this, that before they start each, because they have like a weekly meeting where some senior center or something brings in these caregivers and they have like a support group and they talk about their, their trials and tribulations. Uh, but they start each session by just a, a, quick, a quick sort of meditation where on the in breath, they're saying, uh, I do my best. And on the out breath, they're saying to themselves, I let go of the rest. I do my best, I let go of the rest. And we've had some remarkable, beyond my, my imagine, imagine imagination of what we might be able to achieve with that, and just helping people come in and just give themselves that sort of forgiveness and give themselves sort of that self-compassion that I am doing my best. Uh, and I'm gonna, and, I, and there's a lot of stuff, stuff out of my control I need to let go of, let going of the rest. So I might, uh, I'll just close, but I wanted to uh, close with a quote. Uh, um, by Maya Angelou, who says, uh, people may forget what you say, and people may forget what you do, but they never forget how you make them feel. So take care of yourself. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, your work is, uh, is God's work, and uh, just appreciate your time here this morning. So good luck. Thank you. If anybody has questions, we, we have a few minutes if people have other ideas. If you're, th yes, Hillary. Good, thank God. Well, you know what, uh, 
Logan Hayes. The, uh, what comes to my mind when you talk about that is, uh, is kind of a Buddhist view on perfection. It's uh, the mistakes are part of the perfection. Uh, that, you know, we're, we're doing our best and we are going to make mistakes. Perfection doesn't mean that we always succeed. Perfection means that we allow ourselves to be human. So if that, if you can kind of get your head around that, that the, the, uh, the, the fly in the ointment is part of the perfection, uh, that we're really learning and trying our best. Uh, we learn from our mistakes. None of us in here have ever gone through life thus far uh, mistake-free, uh, whether it's in our home life or in our professional life. Uh, so I, to me, the room I give myself is that it's part of the perfection. Is that I'm going to make mistakes. I'm going to strive for them. But I'm not going to, and I'm going to try my best not to beat myself up uh, when I do. Uh, there's, uh, you know, the, we all, probably all of us say this to ourselves in some form or another. I'm my own worst enemy. Uh, but we never, I would never say that to somebody else. Hey, I'm your worst enemy. <laughs> so why do I say it to myself? I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm treating myself a lot worse than I treat other people. You know, why don't I give myself the same compassion that I'm trying to give other people? Again, self-compassion is sort of a prerequisite to have sustained compassion for others. But, I mean, you know, it's a Buddhist view, but You know, one thing I, I, I was recalling when we were in Arizona that the, I think the number five cause of death became Alzheimer's. Yeah, number four, right? Yeah, so, so, it was, so Wayne ran this Bureau of Chronic Disease and it was heart disease and stroke and um, cancer. cancer and, and, and then I remember when dementia became on the top five list. And so, and I remember you told me that there were 200,000 people that had Alzheimer's in Arizona. So there were about 6.5 million people, so 200,000 people. It's a lot. But then on average, you told me that three, there were th an average of three family members took care of each person. Am I, is that the numbers were right? Yeah. yeah, so there was, yeah, so there was a total of like 800,000 people. So almost like one out of six families were dealing with dementia. And I have to tell you, so, you know, since then, I've had that happen in my family with my mother. And I know some of my friends in the room have also had this happen with their families. And, you know, we see the, we see patients with dementia all the time. And it's, sometimes it's a little, it's frustrating, right? It's annoying. Like they can't tell you what happened and they keep falling down and the family doesn't know what to do with them and they drop them off. And we're just like, it's the last thing we want to do. But, you know, once you actually have that in your family and you go through it and it's a daily, it's just a, daily chaos of what's going on you you, you get it um and you know it's just that it's just i just want to kind of share that like i've learned to appreciate that that whole thing i know some friends in the room are going through that also um, and everything changes once you had you know you've gone through whatever you're you're seeing or, you know or taking care of the people it just it changes all of your empathy and compassion and everything because you're like okay I, I i understand what's going on here and, and there's this, this issue that uh especially among spouses as one spouse might be really really early onset dementia it's hot it's not identified of course i mean when, when you say when ben says two hundred thousand people had dementia two hundred thousand people were told they had dementia uh probably twice that number uh, had dementia of some form what happens in our family relationships uh, uh, is that, what do you mean you forgot? Or, you know, how can, we just talked about that yesterday. Don't you listen to me? I mean, we think, this is like, you know, spouses and partners can talk to each other like that, uh, only to find out later that there was some early dementia going on and the guilt that people have in terms of uh, how they treated that person unknowingly, even though from an outsider per, you know, perspective, we know well, that, that wasn't their fault. And, Again, that's part of the perfection. Uh, it, it, maybe it wasn't right, but it, in hindsight, that's what happened. So just uh, putting my gaming hat on for just a second, uh, I want each and every one of you actually to take out your phones and take a picture of this because uh, um, you guys should have the badge buddies or the badge cards that were given to you. These are not just numbers thrown up to check a box. Um, this is... 
JT, and JT is the Seattle JT is a player assistance program, um, so that you have access to this provider help um, anytime you need it. This is 24 hours. Um, we've seen an uptick in the use of EAP through the pandemic. Um, that's a good thing in, the, in one way. The fact that it's being used, obviously it's not a good thing that it's needing to be used, um, but it's, there's a stigma behind it. Um, many of you have heard about Lorna Breen, an emergency physician who died in New York by suicide um, during the pandemic. Um, I have a personal, um, Lorna and I actually were friends when I was in college and, and that really hit home um, to see that happen to someone who had no history of mental illness. Um, she was getting help but she had never needed it before. Um, please use these resources to reach out and talk to people that are closer to you, yourself or people that you care about. Thanks, Sam. Any other thoughts, questions? Okay, thank you again, Wayne. Okay, thanks, Wayne. Thank you.